Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to say hello and welcome you all and say thank you for joining us today for the fourth webinar in our series on managing growth in the new West. My name is Hannah Jakes and I am a project director at Future West. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit organization who is based in Bozeman, but we've worked throughout the Northern Rockies region for over 10 years. Our mission is to help communities identify and create the future that they want. And we try to do that by providing people, oftentimes key decision makers, with the information training and technical assistance and facilitation services that they need to make wise decisions on an array of conservation, development, and growth related issues. So growth and how it's affecting our communities, our rural landscapes, and even our public lands has become a front burner issue in many places. And while that this is not necessarily something that's new with the advent of the COVID pandemic, um, and as I'm sure you all are seeing as summer hits its stride, the pace of growth and change seems to be increasing by the day and the impacts are becoming more and more acute. And we are fortunate that there are some astounding examples of people and communities that have recognized these challenges challenges and are taking steps to overcome them. And I just want to express gratitude to all of you who are already working on these issues because it informs and inspires us here at Future West. And given what's at stake, such as our historic communities, our wide open working landscapes and our spectacular natural areas, we need to take whatever steps are appropriate to meet these challenges. And knowing what those steps are is in a lot of ways a completely different story. And that's why we've teamed up with a number of people to host this series of webinars on several of the most salient growth management topics here in the region. Our speakers today are two people that we feel very privileged to host and they will be addressing the timely and important subject of tools for protecting rural agricultural lands and open space. Our first speaker, Randy Carpenter is a planner and project director here at Future West. He has spent his career working with community leaders across the Northern Rockies to help them understand the challenges that come with growth and change and works closely with them to develop and tailor locally based solutions to those challenges. Prior to joining Future West in 2014, Randy was a community planner in Iowa and followed by 13 years as part of the Sonoran Institute's Northern Rockies program. He holds an undergraduate degree in history and a graduate degree in urban and regional planning, both from the University of Iowa. Randy will be followed by our featured speaker, Jim Stone, a third generation rancher and an MSU Bobcat who ranches in the Blackfoot Valley in Ovando. In addition to ranching, Jim chairs the board of the Blackfoot Challenge and is also on the board of the National Group Partnerscapes. He is renowned for his attention to the process and the practice of bringing diverse stakeholders together to collaboratively address the challenges facing rural communities and beyond. He operates from a premise that people are our most valuable asset and partnerships are critical for leveraging knowledge and science to achieve shared community goals. We are very fortunate to have both he and Randy joining us today. Before Randy gets started, I want to introduce my colleague, Allison Berry, who will give you some direction on a brief poll and also give you some background on the Q&A portion of the presentation, which will begin immediately after Randy and Jim finish. So I will pass it to Allison. Thanks, Hannah, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Um, as Hannah mentioned, I will be facilitating a poll and I will also be moderating the question and answers portion of this webinar after our speakers have done their presentations. So uh, let's start off with the poll. I'll just bring it up and give you guys a few seconds to um, answer. We'll just give us a little bit about background information about who is in our audience here today. So I'll give you a few minutes to um, provide your answers. Okay, we have more than two thirds of our audience responding. I'll give you a few more seconds here. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. 
and I'll share the results here. As you can see, most of our audience today is from Montana, and we have people in a variety of fields, including planning, community development, engineering, environmental, and other. Thanks for your responses. That helps us uh, tailor our webinar so that we can provide the best experience for everybody. Uh, and just a little bit about the Q&A before we continue. Um, we will have a question and answer session after the presentations, as I mentioned. Please type in your questions at any time in the Q&A panel. I do have the chat open if you want to um, chat with the panelists, but the Q&A I will be paying closer attention to. So that's where uh, your questions should go so we can have a great discussion today. And with that, I will hand the controls over to Randy. I'm going to stop my screen share. And Randy, you can pull up your presentation. Okay, thanks, Allison. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I don't think that any of us here on this call today, or most anybody who lives in this area who would disagree that the notion with the notion that um, our agricultural lands and rural open spaces are really crucial to, uh, you know, of course our economy and to providing food and fiber and just to the iconic nature of our quality of, of life here. Um, but as we all know, those qualities are, are threatening, um, are being threatened by the growth that, that, that is uh, being attracted here. We have record amounts of growth in just in the last year, and we expect that to continue. Um, now, our, <clears throat> the, the land trust in the region um, like the Montana Land Reliance, have done a fantastic job of protecting tens of thousands of acres of agricultural lands in the Northern Rockies and in, in Montana and many other land trusts as well. But um, unfortunately, conservation easements alone really can't get the job done. Um, it's gonna take other tools and there are many tools in the toolbox and one of those tools is indeed land use regulations. Now, sometimes I joke with my friends at Montana Land Reliance about this bumper sticker, which I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, cows not condos. And my reply is, but we want condos, uh, but we want them in the right place. That is in our cities and towns. And that's really the, the focus of what both Jim and I are going to Talk about today. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't been doing that very well in the last few decades. This is just an example right here at home in, in uh, Gallatin County, uh, which shows that the city and town share of growth um, has been dropping uh, in the last few decades. It's 70% of our population lived in our cities and towns in 1970. And over the next few decades, rural growth rates were more than twice as fast as urban growth rates. So that number dropped down to about 55%. And you know, the result is literally tens of thousands of acres uh, in the Northern Rockies, if not hundreds of thousands of acres of land that has been converted to um, from agriculture to rural residential or exurban residential development. So we can, we can do better than that. Um, here in Gallatin County, again, just another example. Um, if instead of getting the 50% of the houses in cities that we've been getting you know, the last few decades, uh, we got 70% of our houses in cities, that would save over 20,000 acres of land from being converted from agriculture to residential in, in just the next couple of, of decades. Um, so that's done without spending you know, millions of dollars on, on conservation easements. It's just done through common sense coordination, 
between cities and counties and deciding that uh, within our cities, that's where we want growth to happen. And then implementing that uh, through land use regulations like Sheridan County, Wyoming did. Um, rural county, uh, county seat is the city of Sheridan and they could see the trends. Um, they could see that all the growth they're getting, most of it in rural areas, was really you know, threatening the future of their agriculture, uh, of, and of their open spaces. And so they put together a plan in Wyoming, they call them a comprehensive plan, a land use plan for the future that you know, gives a vision for what we wanna look like in, in the next few decades. And that plan stated, it's like really where our, our cities and towns is where our urban, quote, urban, uh, urban for small rural Western Mon uh, Northern Rockies, um, that's where our growth should be. So everybody does that, or most everybody does that. You know, they, they say that, you know, in their plans, which are not regulatory, they say, yeah, it's, we, want, we don't want to have our valleys paved over with subdivisions, but it's kind of rare to see someone actually do something. In fact, I was uh, attended a, a panelist presentation a couple months ago, and um, it was a small rural county in Montana, and the county commissioner was preceded by someone from the Forest Service and someone from Emergency Services. And they were all lamenting about the cost of this rural growth to, um, to their roads budgets and emergency services demands and agricultural lands. But at the end of it, the county commissioner sort of threw up his hands and said, but gee, there's nothing we can do about it. It's out of our hands. You know, there's just nothing we can do. You can't tell a person where to where to develop and where not to develop. Well, Sheridan County decided that not only is our comprehensive plan going to say that, but indeed um, we're going to implement that plan through land use regulations, that is through zoning. And they did that. So outside of the cities and towns in Sheridan County, they decided that they would limit rural development to one home per 80 acres. Now, if you were to do what's called conservation subdivision design and you keep homes away from riparian areas and rivers and prime agricultural soils, that is you cluster um, homes away from those areas uh, that you could get one home per 20 acres with conservation design. So just a simple, common sense, smart strategy to maintain what is special about Sheridan County. And here's uh, a map of that uh, Sheridan County zoning. So you can see where the, the yellow is, is residential and um, I guess the red is commercial, uh, purple is industrial. But they're saying in and around Sheridan and the little towns like Ranchester and Dayton, that's where we want growth to go. That green, the rest of it is their agricultural zoning. That's again, that's one home per 80 acres. Um, so again, just a simple common sense um, strategy to maintain they want, which starts from that fundamental premise that in our cities and towns is where growth should occur. So I am, with that short introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Stone with another example from Powell County, Montana of um, maintaining agricultural lands by deciding where you want growth to go and then uh, implementing strategies to make that happen. Jim? Very, Randy, thank you. And Allison, Hannah, Dennis, thank you so much for the uh, invite today. And just it's an honor to be part of Future West. And these discussions are, are always very interesting. And I'll try to be brief and uh, 
I'll give you just a little background uh, of what we tried to do and are currently doing in Powell County. And I'll probably <laughs> preface by saying you've heard the sort of statement that, you know, I'm not really a doctor, but I play one on TV. Uh, that's kind of how I feel like being on here today. I, I really <laughs> have no no expertise in planning or or even should be um, associated with the, the outcome of what happened in Powell County. But what I really want to talk to you folks about today is it's really got to come from the ground up, right? And and so often as landowners or, uh, you know, whether you're a small landowner or ranching, it always seems to be some of this top down. And I think um, our, our view uh, from Powell County started right at uh, right at the dirt level. And I think that that's uh, kind of where I want to start today. And Randy, if you want to put up that uh, map there, perfect. Uh, just so people kind of know uh, where Powell County in relation to Great Falls, Missoula. We're a very rural uh, county. Uh, <laughs> people do talk about population uh, increases in Powell County. That's because we have a prison prison system. <laughs> And you know, probably not to laugh at, but it, it's kind of we're still a very rural ranching uh, uh, county. I'm very lucky to live in a watershed called the, in the Blackfoot Valley. Uh, it's it's has three different counties, so that adds complexity when you look at the northern end of, of Powell County. That uh, we're also trying to deal on a watershed scale, not just the county scale. So having three different counties with three different kind of values, commissioners, all those things, control mechanisms, uh, that made it a little bit challenged in, in sort of my hometown of Ovando. But from the Powell County side, um, it I think you'll hear uh, sort of our strategy was a little different than we'd seen really statewide. Um, I just want to back up a little bit. My dad was on, uh, they took a run at, at some local planning back in the 70s and it wasn't on a on a county level and you got to understand then uh, even up till 2000 uh, early 2000s we didn't have any kind of a master land use plan or anything we didn't even have a county planner we kind of shared some thoughts from from uh, other counties but we were very fortunate uh, in the 70s, they learned a few lessons in, in thinking about, and I'll use the example around this little town of Ovando. Uh, they were concerned uh, even then about some how people were dividing land and there was a lot of sort of 20 acre lots and then there was some uh, people wanting to move in. And so you had people on both sides of the page that were anti, just think, no, we shouldn't let anybody in the people that we're trying to. And you, you know, this is not gonna surprise any of you, it starts, those economies were important back then as, as as important as they are today to what we do. But it was more about sort of the human component is that when they got together, they knew who the folks that were going to be the sort of the rebel rousers, or maybe they were the smart ones. But anyway, uh, as a bunch of sort of local ranches, ranchers, they felt maybe a little bit uh, intimidated. So when they started thinking and talking about that planning, they just had the people that kind of sat on their side of the fence, right? And and talked the same language. Well, it didn't take long. And my father said that first thing. He said, Jim, you, you, one thing you learn in life is you at least got to invite everybody to the table. Doesn't mean those folks either side of the uh, uh, decision are going to come, but you have to have that invite. And I've sort of lived my life by that. And I think it's one of the smartest things he ever taught me. But you can imagine they rolled this little plan out and, you know, whether it was Bob or whoever showed up at that public meeting with the commissioners and all he had to do was stand up and go, I, you know, I wasn't part of the plan. I, these guys just did it on their own and, you know, they're a bunch of cowboys and away they went. And so you can imagine politically those, those commissioners had a very hard decision and the, the decision was right. They didn't go forward. So there was no planning. And so it went away. And so it just sat there and we saw pressures coming from the Blackfoot River to everything happening in, in South County of Powell County. Uh, this is this it's it's crazy what how that's changed. And sometimes we just got our head down in the dirt and didn't really pay attention. But in the early 2000s, we went, man, oh, man. Uh, we've got to figure this out and we need to understand we didn't know what pieces of our valley or the rest of the county what they thought or what was what was potential subdivisions 
did it make a difference to school districts, fire departments, churches, you name it, all that stuff started to sort of mull around in all of our minds. But we tended to take a little different angle about uh, how we wanted to plan. So we got people that were just interested in just having a conversation. So we invited those people to the table and it wasn't solely about the commissioners, but we invited the commissioners and they were part of those initial uh, I'm unmuted, but nothing's happening. Hi, all. It looks like Jim's uh, screen might have frozen, so we are just trying to. Jim, there you are. There we go. There we Sorry go. about that. Not a problem. Thank, Thanks, Jim. Thank you. So hopefully, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll make it roundabout quickly, but we found in uh, Powell County with, with seven or eight different of these communities that we needed to get their view. And so basically our master land use plan was built from each of those communities and not everybody thought like we did in Ovando. So we went from planning of where we have a restriction and maybe uh, Randy, you can go ahead and put up uh, the second map there just to sort of show folks how that county's divided up in different uh, zones. Uh, but for example, in our, our uh, two different school districts, Ovando and Helmville, people wanted it very restrictive. And you can see, see there by the colors, uh, you're looking north, like number three. Those are, we have like 160 acre restriction. And, uh, but there's places like Gold Creek that were like, you guys just leave us alone. Let us do our own thing. So the point is, is trying to be respectful for as many people that are willing to listen and willing to be part of a process, be, be that process. So when we brought this to the commissioners, we actually found funding uh, for a county planner. And now we have Scott there. We have a lot of those tools that you all use uh, every day and, and permits and some of those things make people a little onerous and people get get worried but it's a fluid it's a fluid program it's a fluid plan that gets reviewed i mean it can be reviewed annually but it's sort of on a five-year run so people know that man i just didn't like that but i know i can help uh have a conversation five years from now to make that differently so it's again it's coming from the ground up it's about community it's about people and i think so often um in our lives, we either get mandated from, you know, DC or Denver or God knows where. And it isn't about the people. It's about the, pro you know, getting a job done, but it's that process is so important, folks. I mean, if uh, we would have missed a lot of things and it's not a perfect plan. It's not all those things. Uh, we toured around the state looking at different options and we mentioned the word zoning which everybody obviously thought was a four letter word and people thought we were completely nuts and yet it works but we constantly involve the people on the ground and i just um uh, i can't stress that enough it's not <laughs> you know you're not learning anything about county planning or or structure from me because i'm i'm that's not my background but the background to make things work is that generating that sort of durable solution and that's the people that have to live that and uh you know <laughs> it, it's not it, it isn't quick you know people say you know um <laughs> conservation takes one death at a time right or one funeral at a time it's not people all want to change but i think we just opened the toolbox to a ton of people and and listen and you know here i am i'm sitting there talking to all of you uh, the best thing I ever learned is to, to close that trap and, and listen to, to my neighbors. And that's made this made this whole thing work. And again, very rural counties is not going to work everywhere. But I think uh, you see it in the news. Um, it's it's about this respect and we respect uh, as many people's uh, advice or comments. And then you have to have 
you know, uh, an ability to put that in a plan, right? So you still have to spend the money. You got to have that person on a countywide level and you have to have the support of, of your county commissioners. But again, I, I just commend our commissioners and they've changed, obviously. I mean, we started early. Well, I don't even know if we started maybe in the late nineties, but it took, you know, four or five years to get, get through this process. And it's constantly as if you, if you look on the website and see uh, Scott and, you know, the board's fairly fluid, but there's some people that were on there uh, when I was on there back, you know, good golly, it's, uh, you know, since the early 2000s. So uh, that's pretty cool. And people are pretty proud of it. And there's, you know, in, in the North End, uh, we have a ton of conservation easements. So those are concerns and, and, and work well in some, uh, you know, there's all kinds of family, uh, one-time family exclusions. So if we get in trouble financially, potentially, or, you know, a son, daughter comes back, you can allow for some of that expansion, even in this 160 restriction. But, uh, you know, folks, I just, I'm going to kind of shut up and, and hope you guys have some good, good thoughts, questions, and I'm sure we can learn a lot from, from all of you and, and experiences you've had. But again, uh, just, you know, it's this idea of neighboring up guys. And I just think so often it's the plan starts up here and we started right with those communities and each one of them got their, their say and each one of those plans is much different. So flexibility, all those things are extremely important. So Allison, I'll knock off and hopefully uh, folks have, have some thoughts and uh, would love to have those discussions. So thanks for, for letting me be on today and hopefully uh, didn't, didn't ramble. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, Randy. We do have a few questions rolling in. So I just want to encourage folks once again to use the Q&A panel um, and we will dive right in. First up, I have just a, a quick question that came in during Jim's talk about um, um, someone wanted to know how long did the planning process take for Powell County? <laughs> Well, it's probably still ongoing, guys, but I think uh, that initial piece, it probably took four to five years. And I, again, my memory is not as good as it should be, but it, it took a long time. I mean, you can imagine going around the county and having multiple, multiple uh, public meetings in each one of these communities. And then they had to sort of build their own program that had to come back. People started to, to analyze that. And then, you know, we were lucky to have a uh, county planner Ron Hansen from from Butte Silverbow that helped us guide some of those conversations and you know he was such a dynamic speaker very low key he listened he listened he listened and so yeah it's it's uh yeah it's really a long onerous piece but it was kind of fun because you saw people that really cared you know the people that maybe I would have stereotyped as being the one that was going to throw that dagger in there and stop the whole process there's a lot of difference between that and when they can be in public and vent, whether it was good or bad. This, that's the point. So anyway, yeah, <laughs> nothing's easy, right? <laughs> um, all right. And here's a question that came in during Randy's presentation, um, but I don't know um, if you, either of you want to answer it, but it says, uh, have urban growth boundary initiatives been tried? Maybe either in Sheridan County or anywhere in our region? Um, well, not, not in, in our region. Um, they um, are used in Oregon. In fact, they're mandated in, in Oregon. Um, cities set a 20 year growth area, you know, how much you're gonna grow out to in the next 20 years. And outside of that, uh, residential and commercial development for the most part is not allowed. Um, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming are not Oregon. Um, uh, we're very different states and we have very different state legislature. Uh, again, it was mandated by the state legislature in, in Oregon. So it, the, you know, urban growth boundaries per se are not used really in, these, in the Northern Rockies, but um, uh, you know, essentially, if you do essentially what Powell County did, that's sort of what you're doing. I mean, you're saying Helmville, Ovando, uh, Gold Creek, uh, Avon, Deer Lodge, that's where we want growth to go. And that's where we're going to allow, you know, much higher density, sort of, quote, urban-like growth. Uh, and the rest of it is zoned for agriculture. So in a way, we do. 
Yeah. And well said, Randy, and I don't, I think you hit it on the head, but I would just say that was part of the local discussions uh, around each of those communities. And we started to draw those boundaries, but we brought in the adjacent neighbors that said, you know, hey, if you guys are worried about that, are you worried about low income housing or, or, or that expansion of town? You can opt out of the plan and you can be in that envelope of the town of Ovando or whatever. And that, that those, they weren't just a circle. It wasn't a, you know, a cookie cutter approach. It was totally based on those landowners going, nope, I'm, I'm older. I want my kids to be back. I want, and we may need money. So some of those lines were drawn and it, it made people go crazy a little bit, but in the end, it was about making sure their, their voices were heard. And we didn't take a really a right away, you know, from them to, to do what their God given right is to do. Um, okay, Re with respect to Powell County, a question about how have new landowners reacted to the zoning regulations? <laughs> well, there, there's probably a little discussion there amongst uh, uh, over a cocktail or coffee, I think. You know, and, and just to give you all, uh, we are changing a bunch. And uh, in our little town, we're probably 50% uh, absentee owners. And that's changed in my lifetime. Uh, and Helmville's more traditional, but they're seeing changes as, as the ag community gets older, right? We're, we're, we're phasing ourselves out and those things have changed and the markets have obviously made some of those, those changes. But the interesting part is a lot of those folks that come here have a whole set of tools that I don't. And it's a lot of it's like political sophistication. They got a little bit of money probably if they moved in. So they, their view may not be mine, but they may be coming from a place they went, boy, we learned a lesson. And so some of them gone like, good God, you, your 160 is not big enough. You know, so you've, you've gone all over the page, but generally, uh, again, we've welcomed them in. Uh, they get the same voice as I do. Uh, and some of them have great advice and others aren't happy or, you know, uh, but that's part of that review, folks, is it's not a stagnant plan. It's always fluid. And I think giving that to people know there's a window of time that they can go to Scott and, and the planning board and call a meeting and say, hey, you know, in Ovanda, we'd like to talk about this a little bit more. We're seeing some changes and we want to be current and do something. So it's, uh, I, that's not been, in my mind, other neighbors of mine might, might uh, have a different opinion, but I think it's actually been very helpful to sort of open my horizon about, oh, you saw that in Colorado or, you know, wherever. Ah, that's a good thing to learn. We never thought of that. So those are, those are all good, good things. Uh, and so relatedly, have there been any major revisions in your land use plan and zoning regulations? Well, and I'm, I'm wading in deeper than uh, not being on the planning board, but if Scott was here, he'd be able to weigh in. But I think most of it's about you know, a lot of permitting and those kind of just the process pieces of having that plan are, are have, have evolved as we've gone along. The, to speak to our community, um, we're about twice into this review and we haven't changed a bit. Uh, Helmville has, they've looked at uh, options of expanding that, that sort of town uh, community envelope. And they've also talked about, man, that, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how I, or all of you agree or disagree on whether the 160 is great planning. I'm not sure. It was really a sort of a stop gap for us. We had some real big issues that were, that were you know, uh, subdivisions that were platted back in the 70s. And we were scared that that, we, that was just out of control. We wanted to be able to have that a thoughtful discussion about where those went. And they eventually went away. But I think uh, in Helmville, they've talked like, man, that's just too much. We're, we're seeing uh, local families, those kids coming back and want to be part of the, the operation and don't want to, maybe don't want to live on the ranch, but have an option to live closer to town or in, in that community. So they're, they're working on a different uh, approach. And uh, I don't know where that's at today, but uh, for our own community, it's still staying there and I, I'm not sure it's going to stay there forever but uh, again it's it's just a conversation piece uh, on a pretty scheduled time okay 
Um, and this is another question for Jim. Um, you mentioned for the large rural minimum lot sizes, allowances can be made for a family member wanting a lot or financial need to sell off some land. And um, the question is, could you briefly explain how Powell Camp County handles this? Well, they have a, uh, if it, and it may have changed and I apologize if I'm way behind guys, but they had a board of adjustments. So it was, a, again, uh, these boards are made up of local community members throughout the county. And they had the ability for myself to go in and go, hey guys, you know, we're financially struck here or, you know, my son's coming back and we'd like to, you know, do that one-time family exclusion or uh, division off the corner of the ranch and do that. And that had to pass through that board of adjustments. But there were numerous when I was on that of opportunity, you know, you things that you never thought would come up. But again, it's that thoughtful piece that you were able to sort of field all this stuff. You could be heard, uh, you could get this stuff done. And you've seen smaller lot sizes in the envelope of Ovando started out like at five to 10 acres. And now they're talking about one acre pieces or smaller, depending on where that is. So I think uh, all that, all again, all those tools are there. That board of adjustments uh, is very uh, functional and effective. And that goes back to the planning board and then back to the commissioners. So you have multiple you know, layers to make comments or if you don't agree, it, it, it goes through that layer that helps you hopefully achieve your goals. And uh, I wouldn't say it always happens for folks, but again, I think it's just, it's a clearer message than, I mean, but it wasn't 70, it was nothing. It was just open. You could do whatever you wanted. And I think it's, it's, it's a water quality, quantity, all these things, clean air, all this stuff is part of this plan, which you all know that, and everybody's been doing it way sooner than we did. But those kind of things are pretty welcomed by people that went, yeah, it's a little bigger than just building a house. It's about looking at this from a watershed or county perspective. Okay. Um, and maybe this is a qu good question for Randy. Are there other Montana counties that have done zoning districts? I don't know. Um, yes, there um, have been many counties that have uh, instituted zoning but really Powell County by far is the best example of a county that did that countywide, took a comprehensive look at the entire county and said, you know, the needs in the north part of the county may be different than the needs in the southern part of the county. And as Jim said, we're gonna bring everybody to the table uh, and decide what makes sense for us. Uh, now what other counties have done is um, done very piecemeal uh, zoning. That is, um, we, we have two different kinds of zoning, uh, rural or county zoning in Montana. One we call part one zoning, which is sort of a uh, landowner initiated. Um, you get a bunch of your neighbors together and you can do a zoning district. Um, and then there's part two, which is county initiated, which is what Powell County did. Um, for part two zoning, really Powell County is the one that, you know, is the best example, uh, I think, and, and the one that's been done comprehensively. I think Gallatin County has, I know that Sean O'Callaghan, I can see he's on here, but I, there's, I don't know, 20 some zoning districts, part one landowner initiated zoning districts in uh, Gallatin County. And the key there is those part one zoning districts do not have to uh, follow the county's growth policy or comprehensive plan. They can just, they can go the opposite direction of what, you know, that large plan, that comprehensive plan or growth policy says. Um, so, you know, in some ways they don't work that well in other areas, it's the only tool they probably can use. Okay, um, I do have some uh, response is coming in the chat. Sean O'Callaghan says Gallatin County has 15 part one and seven part two zoning districts. Um, someone else chatted in wanting a little bit of an update on Gallatin County. So hopefully that addresses that a little bit more. Um, another question for Jim. Um, Jim, you mentioned that landowners in Gold Creek didn't want to be included. How did the planning group deal with that request and how is it reflected in the map? 
Well, again, I think you can see some of that just in what the lot sizes are not. But I mean, I remember some of those were just like, um, will you guys just leave us alone? Uh, we don't want any planning. And we just went, cool. So as those have all developed a little bit, as things have changed and they went, oh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe this plan isn't as bad so we can do some of this. They just came at it from a different angle than, than we did here. And a lot of what, not saying Gold Creek uh, doesn't have great farming abilities, they do, we're farming and ranching there. It's just a different mindset of what they thought was appropriate for their community. Uh, here, uh, yeah, we'd, I don't think uh, we've used much different tools for, for uh, planning uh, to maintain ag. I mean, conservation easements with uh, numerous, numerous uh, holders of those easements have um, been great. I mean, I think the center part of uh, the Blackfoot Valley, which is roughly a, a million and a half acre watershed in, in most, of, most of that in Powell County, there's like 182,000 acres of conservation easements. And those are, as you all know, can come in all different colors and, and sizes, what that looks like. In the, in the lower end of the valley towards Missoula, uh, Potomac and a lot of landowners have been working hard with Five Dollars Land Trust and they've done a lot of, uh, oh, I'm not gonna say it right, Randy, but uh, bonds that the, the voters have, have done in Missoula County to help protect that. And they see, they see that map and going, let's, let's pony up some money for these bonds to help these folks maintain that rural landscape. And so there's, I, I think that that's the neat part of it is all these three counties have had really creative ways to work together, but we had to sort of, I don't, I'm not saying we stepped away from Powell County, but we had to look at our watershed as all three counties. And so it, it's made that conversation much different as well. But uh, so yeah, long story, sorry to drag on there, but all good stuff. Oh, that's fine. Um, and um, with respect to Powell County, was your effort part one or part two zoning? Um, I was sort of in response to what happened. Yeah, I don't know, now. Randy. You helped me out on that one. I'm I'm assuming two more than one. Yeah, that was part two zoning. Okay. Um, how about the Blackfoot Challenge? How has your or has your nonprofit organization, the Blackfoot Challenge, been involved in any of these land use planning issues? We we have not, as far as uh, the actual plan. So the great part of that sort of strategy of the challenge is what our position was was making sure that if there was a opportunity for some public opinion uh, comments, so we would do numerous uh, public meetings. In, in our valley, which the Blackfoot Challenge would host. So you'd have that sort of framework of what the Blackfoot Challenge I think does best is to sort of disseminate information and really not get into the mud of saying this is good or bad. It's about bringing those, inviting those people, uh, building that trust. And that's one thing the challenge did have is ahead of that had already built a lot of trust within the valley that people felt safe. They could come there and you know, speak it without somebody, you know, blowing that up on their phone and, and, you know, making fun of them or something like that. So that's kind of where the challenge fit in there. But it was really done by a sort of a separate group of landowners that worked directly with the county planners and the commissioners. Okay. Uh, another question about Powell County. I noticed that you have established building setbacks along all the rivers and streams. Was that difficult? And how has that worked out? Yeah, that was a very interesting conversation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it, it has. I'll give you one example. Uh, some folks bought a 500 acre par uh, parcel and the, the house they bought, actually the deck went right out into the Blackfoot. And they, I mean, there was other issues related to that house, but in the end, they ended up tearing that house down and moving it back uh like 300 and some feet and then they worked with the local trout unlimited group to restore that uh floodplain and did a lot of really cool reveg and those kind of things so it's a way i think again you come into powell county you come to the blackfoot it's a little different way of thinking and so people are have have been very respectful of my predecessors my mentors if you will in the 70s that thought of a different way to do business and not just keep 
jamming it down the, the trail on a rail, they said, let's be creative and let's work with our partners. And, you know, we're not scared to work with EPA or, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Forest Service or anybody else. That's, we welcome that deal. And I think it's made, made our plan in the county. And I think it made what we do here in, in this valley much more powerful. So people, you know, we're building that big piece of respect that I think, you know, we're only gonna be here for a short time. And by God, we better take care of what we have. And I think people really respect that. And that, you know, uh, again, uh, it's not everybody's wish, but it's a, it's a good process. Um, so here's one about um, the ag community. Speaking of the ag community getting older, do you have any concerns about so much being zoned for ag, but not enough interest from the younger generation? <laughs> to it in? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm smart enough to answer that question very well because that yeah, I think it's that's one of those things nobody really knows yet. But I also would say that because we work with about anybody that wants to work with us, that we're finding a ton of tools that probably are driving my son crazy that his dad wasn't smart enough to figure out. So what worked for me 35, 40 years ago, we're doing it a completely different way. Uh, this time. And I think diversifying our, you know, our bottom line that, you know, we got people driving through the valley. Are we going to be talking ecotourism? Are we going to be doing some of these things? So there's opportunity out there that may not be solely about cows. Uh, wildlife is a huge piece of this valley and, and Powell County. So I think uh, we're looking that way. Uh, I'll give you one example of a sixth generation ranch in Helmville. Uh, you talk to those and they've they've got like you know nine different kids with three different others uh and how can they come back and add value to that ranch and i've heard numerous of those nine young folks come back and said you know we we had the ability to go somewhere else or do something else in life but because of powell county and because of the blackfoot challenge we came home because we know we have that toolbox. We have the ability to change and, and make things different. And those folks are, are going light years ahead of what my mind does. And so we're creating more economy in a different way. And so I think, you know, change is great, right? So I just, yeah, just opening our minds. Sounds good. Um, uh, here's a question about landowners. Um, what are the most common reasons given by landowners for choosing not to protect workable agricultural lands? Why are they choosing to do other things? I'm not sure I can, uh, Randy may be able to, to bounce in here. I, I don't know all of those, but I think the transition as, you know, some kids aren't coming back or some didn't have kids. So they're, they're worrying about what that future is. Um, you know, I, I don't know, Randy bailed me out of that one. I'm not sure I can speak for people that, you know, that it, that's a pretty personal thing. You know, you do estate planning in this Valley, you know, we do a lot of estate sort of, you know, uh, information sharing with the challenge, but people are pretty, you know, they carry her pretty close, which I think is great. But, uh, so I'm not sure I would even be justified to sort of speak to what people think there, but I don't know, Randy, what are you, what are you hearing around the state? Well, I just think it's, you know, it's the most common to me that that I hear, and it seems sort of intuitive, is economic reasons, financial reasons. Um, you know, uh, maybe their operation is, you know, uh, not producing the, you know, the, the, the return on investment that they, they have there, and they can see a higher return, you know, from, from doing something else. But besides this, uh, those sort of transition issues, I would guess that it, financial is the main one yeah I, I would just maybe add you're getting my mind going a little bit randy but a lot of these folks that do come in that are absentee owners you know whether they're six months or three weeks a year they've been really good about uh, most of them tried the cattle deal and they went that was ridiculous i didn't make all this money to throw it away like that you guys are nuts but they're willing to pick up the phone and call jim and brady and go hey would you like to lease our place you can run some more cows you can do you know Help us help us do what you guys do best we, we're not sure but let's do it together and maybe uh we're going to concentrate on you know more of a healthy fisheries and some things recreation wise than what you normally do but we want cows there as well so that's added you know some economy that we can expand and and 
you know, increase our bottom line along with sort of protecting the fact that they buy these places and go, oh, well, that's a lot of work. And then they don't go split them up or, or just go back on the market. Uh, in Powell County, did you set measurable performance goals like maintaining a minimum acreage in commercial agriculture or percent of development in towns versus countryside? Um, I'm going to plead the fifth on that. I think all those things I'm sure came up and I'm sure they're present in what they talk about uh, today. Uh, I know they talk about that a lot in Missoula County. Uh, and again, that, that's out of my uh, wheelhouse to tell you exactly what those are. But um, if Scott was on from Powell County, he'd probably have a great answer for you there. But I, I really truly don't know that answer. Um. Let's see. Okay, I have a question from Kim. Uh, she says, we are in the process of updating our development code and zoning. We are contemplating possibly doing away with open space requirements in the rural areas and going to larger minimum lot sizes. We've had open space requirements, but it really hasn't worked out the way we had hoped. She's wondering if we have thoughts on this. And I'm not sure, Kim, maybe you could um, add in where you're, where you're located, where you're working at. Um, Randy or Jim, any thoughts on the value of uh, minimum lot sizes versus open space requirements? I'm going to bounce out one to Randy. I think that's better. Um, well, I, you know, I'm not sure what they do down in, in Fremont County, what, what uh, the open space requirement is. If that means an open space requirement within a subdivision, um, you know, you you can have so much for lots, but a certain percentage of it must not be developed and kept in open space. Um, that, you know, uh, will make for sub lot, you know, subdivisions that have park land in them, but it won't protect, you know, the wide swaths of agricultural land. Um, and uh, I think that's what you're talking about, Kim. Um, but I'm not entirely clear. It's been a long time since I've looked at Fremont County's development code. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, so, okay, for Jim, how have land use re regulations been integrated with more voluntary conservation easements? So, say that again. Please, Allison, if you would mind. Um, the question is just about how land use regulations have been integrated with voluntary actions like conservation easements. Yeah. How work together. Uh, I, I guess I'd, I think they go hand in hand. I wouldn't say uh, whether people are sort of stressed about the county, you know, the, the, the planning piece when they're talking about easements with, with one of the easement holders, whether there's a, you know, well, if we we go this way, we can't do this. I'm, I don't think there's any conflict personally with uh, the county plan uh, that would regulate, uh, you know, anything we do here. We have a uh, fish and wildlife service uh, easement on this ranch and, you know, it follows the book of what that easement is with those folks. And then the county plan falls on top of that if we're doing, you know, the typical water quality, you know, those things that they normally permit for, but we're probably not even close to what a lot of counties in, in Montana are for, for regulations and permitting. Uh, compared to Missoula County, uh, most people want to flock to Powell County because not only it's just the expanse, but it takes more time and understanding that the workload is incredible in Missoula County. I'm not making fun of that at all. It's just a matter of it's it's we haven't we haven't come that far we're still that very rural county and you know when you have people that are commissioners that fill fill that seat and the landowners community members that are making those decisions from the ground that sort of follows along so will it you know in in my son's lifetime will those permits and those regulations change you can probably bet on it but hopefully it'll be done in the respectful way to do it Um, so you emphasize the importance of process and inviting everyone to the table. Has that process and relationship building around planning opened up the door for other opportunities in the community? <laughs> A ton of it. Yeah. 
I mean, I, you know, and I don't mean to, you know, harbor the whole process thing, but that's, that's the, that's the model of the Blackfoot challenge. Uh, it's not necessarily how Powell County does it or any other community does it, but in the Blackfoot, that doesn't matter whether we're talking grizzly bears, wolves, uh, you know, river recreation or any of those things, it's got to fit into that process. And that means a very thoughtful, it could be very long. <laughs> you hear the word proper pacing uh, a ton that, you know, we'll, Jim would fly off the handle and go, God, we just saw 60 rafts go down the river on, on Saturday at one fishing access and people just go, you know, crazy and lose their mind. We would back that up and go, okay, you know, how's our power our partners feeling? So I think, uh, you know, it, we love, you know, I love get. I think conservation and wildlife, whatever it is, ranching is in our blood, right? It's in our DNA, but the, the secret is, is how we address each other and that respectful peace. And we don't, you know, I always been told that, you know, if you have an organization like the challenge and, and you include volunteers in doing things and you have separate committees that talk about whatever resource issue or whatever education, whatever it is. And all of a sudden the board goes, well, let's just do that. And they make that decision. Do you think you get volunteers or people want to sit on those committees? They're like, well, they don't really care. It's just a bunch of people sitting at the top of the heap and they're going to make those own decisions. But do you know how long it takes to talk about, you know, bears or wolves when it goes back through the wildlife committee and go through all the work groups, and then it comes back with a recommendation for the board and then the board likes, you know, all that stuff. That's that proper pacing, but that works through the county planning. It works through everything we do. And I just can't tell you how, important that is and I uh, as uh, Anna mentioned we're on this uh, national landowner group partnerscapes and you see examples that are far better than what we do across the country but most of it is always driven by some resource or something driving people nuts and they can't sit back and, and be patient about that process and when you fail you fall on that sword and so I hate you know I sound like a maybe someone from the government, you know, it's this sort of framework, but that framework is, is, is the most important thing I've, I've learned in my lifetime is that's how we get this stuff done. And I, I just can't stress that enough, whether you're talking zoning planning or anything else. Um, so sort of a related question for the same um, person uh, with respect to your partnerscape work, um, how do you communicate the work you've done on your local level planning? How do you communicate this approach to the national group, uh, the partnership group, or on your visits to DC? And yeah, how that yeah. Somebody's been reading my mail or something. Somebody probably, <laughs> they're baiting me in, Allison. I don't know. No, I, I think it's, uh, uh, we love to talk about the things we do here, but usually when you go somewhere else and we've got, uh, landowners in 15 different states. So we're not even, we're close across the country, but we kind of span the country and, and who sits on, on that board at this present time. And you see some wonderful examples. It may not fit for Montana, may not fit for Texas or Maine or whatever, but the, this sort of thoughtful, durable solution idea that we're, we've got to be human beings and we, we need that. If we lose trust, I mean, if I, if I do something and people go, I, my God, Jim, what were, you, what were you thinking? It takes generations sometimes to get that trust back. And I think that's the message we, we sort of carry across the country. And, you know, when you're on a, on a we're, we're Zoomers now, right? Since the COVID thing, but we can't get together. We talk on the phone a lot, a lot of conference calls and now Zoom, but we do an annual meeting where we bring all of our part, as many partners we can and new landowners. And we talk about a lot of these issues that we're talking about today. It's not just about, you know, cows. It's it's about how do we manage this country and 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 the open space and things that mean how are we gonna, you know, clothe and you know, food and fiber for this country is is a pretty important piece of what we do. But that all ties into what we're talking about today. So here's a question about working with county commissioners or face change. Has your county commission more or less stayed the course on supporting countywide zoning over the years? Abs absolutely. Yeah, they couldn't have. Um, and I think they will, <laughs> again, it's back to, I got a broken record. I think it's back to the process because they feel comfortable that they don't have to be out there to be the lightning rod 
that they go to a public meeting and somebody's trying to knock them out of their chair. Mm -hmm. They're coming in with the community saying, this is kind of what we'd like. Doesn't mean they always vote on our side, but across the spectrum of things that we do in this county, they're, they're like, man, you guys did all the work. Thank you. Now we can make good decisions. We can find the money to help you. So, you know, we've sort of taken that political bite uh, that makes everybody go nuts. We, we, we use them as, as a great resource and they're very, very helpful. And, and they have changed a lot in my lifetime. And yet we're still, but that's checking in, right? Allison, you've got to go, you got to go back. You can't just leave them out and go, well, I thought you'd read about it. It's always going, checking in and going, are you, what are your guys' concerned or ladies concerned? Sounds like a lot of work, constantly checking in with everybody, <laughs> trying to get them all involved. Meeting, um, meetings are us, right, Randy? Um, okay, a question about tax incentives. Are tax incentives provided to developers who develop brown grounds in quote unquote urban areas instead of on a viable ag land? Um, yeah, Randy. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what, what Mark means about uh, brown grounds. I don't know if he means brown fields um, or just uh, vacant lands in, in urban areas. Um, I'll, I'll take the, the first one, uh, brown fields. Yes, there are some tax incentives for development in brown areas with brown fields. Uh, that is uh, I should, uh, Brownfield being an area that was contaminated with a leaky underground storage tank or something like that, that has since been cleaned up, the oil, the soil uh, uh, removed and, and replaced. Um, now, just in terms of tax incentives for just vacant urban lands, uh, generally, generally there's not. Uh, sometimes there are through tax increment financing, um, but generally not. You know, um, our first two, uh, our, our, our second and third panelists uh, in this webinar series, Joe Minicosi and Chuck Marone, uh, talked a lot about how um, urban development um, uh, especially more uh, compact, you know, uh, multifamily, more vertical urban development um, pro uh, provides real tax incentives for the taxpayer, the rest of us. Um, they produce much more uh, property tax revenues per acre than anything else. It's just astounding. Uh, you know, the uh, two block uh, or the two acre block in which I, you know, sit right now, downtown Bozeman uh, generates about the same amount of property taxes as the 20 acre Walmart uh, out on North 7th. So uh, while, you know, most in town development does not receive tax incentives, it provides great tax benefits back to taxpayers. And I would just take a minute to remind folks that are all those those webinars that, that Randy just mentioned are available, the recordings are available to watch if folks want to tune into those. And I believe they are on Future West YouTube channel if you'd like to find those. Um, although I'm sure Hannah will correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see, a question about Sheridan County um, for Randy. Um, you mentioned that the development could be different uh, if it was in a conservation development or not, how much development has occurred in the um, conservation development mode versus the like one home per 80 acre mode? Yeah, that's a real good question. Um, I, and I don't know the answer to that. I haven't been, you know, I haven't talked to the Sheridan County folks for, geez, uh, I suppose it's been a couple of years since I've been down there visiting them. Um, it's, it's a concept that really, you know, uh, I'll be honest, hasn't really caught on. It's, you know, it's basically the idea that, uh, just take a simple example, we've got a uh, hundred acres and rather than develop them, uh, that hundred acres into 10, 10 acre lots, um, 
uh, let's do uh, you know those 10 lots uh, on just 10 acres. So 10 one acre lots, again, clustered away from those areas you wanna protect, whether that's prime egg soils or riparian areas or river, you know, river banks or whatever. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's not a huge uh, uh, number of, you know, of examples of conservation design in rural development out there. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's uh, time will come in the future, um, but um, I don't know if Sheridan has, has seen much of that. Okay. Uh, and uh, Hannah did just chime in about um, that the webinar recordings postings, they are on the Future West YouTube channel. And this, what she wanted to note also that this webinar, today's webinar will also be posted there later today. So if folks want to share that with colleagues or rewatch it, they uh, are able to find it there. And the link will be in our follow-up email as well. And uh, here's a question for Jim. Um, what do you think Powell County would look like if you hadn't done this uh, zoning and development district? Oh boy, that's a, yeah, that uh, looking through that lens is a little tough, but I, I mean, I think it would have changed. It would have changed uh, a little bit here, I think, in how some of the, the communities look. I think we needed to have that uh, at least that conversation. And I think with what's, you know, thank God we were potentially talking about it 10 years before sort of all this is starting to, to come uh, to light. So I just think we had so many other tools that was more important to what people wanted, whether again, it's, uh, you know, working with, you know, I mean, we had this huge uh, Plum Creek timber presence in the Valley that the Nature Conservancy and the challenge and a ton of partners helped get handled so if those things would not have happened uh that would have changed our life uh, you know you know just been amazing uh so good or bad i guess you can say well you you could have had some nice uh development there but i think those tools are as as important i'm not sure scott would say on a county-wide piece whether we're seeing that much because there's just not a lot of people moving to to powell county you know we're sort of maintaining this this population and it can change in a blink. It's probably, it's worrisome to a lot of people right now just based on the last two years. But uh, yeah, I just think, I think we had that whole slate of tools that uh, isn't just about, which drives people crazy. I think if it's like all you have is a county plan, maybe people aren't gonna be very happy with that. But if you have that whole slate of things that help, uh, you know, you probably will get more buy-in. Okay, great. Well, that winds up our questions. I wanted to uh, give Randy and or Jim an opportunity for any closing thoughts or comments. I'm sure you're happy to have me quit talking would be probably the biggest piece for most people and go have lunch. But no, I, I just want to thank all of you. I mean, I think these things are, for us, it's really important. And I think the fact that uh, landowners are willing to come sort of put themselves out there. Our voice needs to be heard. We're not very good at it most times. And I think it's it's uh, time that we do talk about a lot of that. And so I'm just honored to, to have all you all join and not sure I added a whole lot to it, but I think uh, the piece we need to be really thinking about is this communication link. And it, it, you know we've got to figure out how to uh, work in that urban world that we probably don't understand and i think that's going to change if we can figure that out and that's kind of where partnerscapes moves is to uh, make that a little friendlier and i think we'll find ourselves trying to work together instead of always opposing ourselves great uh, well thank you so much jim and thanks randy i will go ahead and turn things over to hannah she's gonna close things out with a, a couple of final reminders yeah well, first of all, Jim and Randy are incredibly modest and I just, uh, we can't thank them both enough for their time and their thoughts on these issues because they're not, as folks know, easy ones to think through and talk through, but they're both very committed to the work that they do. And we're really fortunate to have, I just want to say thank you for coming to speak on your, your ideas and your experiences and the work that you do and have done and continue to do. So 
we are really appreciative of that. And I also wanna say thank you to all of the audience for your thoughtful questions on these issues. I know they're at the forefront of a lot of your minds and it's a gift to get to kind of bring people together even in a virtual format to have the chance to have these kinds of conversations. So thank you all as well. Um, we appreciate everything that you're doing. And just as a couple housekeeping items and a reminder, um, this is a monthly series that we'll be doing. And so uh, next month in mid-July, we will be focusing on addressing how to improve city and county collaboration on managing growth. And the date for that will be, uh, is to be determined, but details will follow on that. And also at the end of this uh, webinar, you'll have a survey pop up that will just ask you a couple questions. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. We really appreciate your feedback on that because it also helps us structure the format of these webinars to best serve all of you. So with that being said, I hope that you all enjoy a safe and pleasurable start to your <laughs> summer. So thank you. Thanks, Anna. Oh, thanks, everyone. Thank you take, all. Take care, everyone. <laughs>